Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. We've been uh, considering this uh, ethically problematic category of leadership and smacking down the widespread current Muslim tendency to interpret it in managerial terms. Uh, from our perspective, this is something which is a charism, a robe of honour, which uh, almost as part of a kingly procedure is vested in us from elsewhere. The uh, prophetic individual does not seek prophecy. The true monarch is born to his role. So we began this series with deconstructing uh, in what were perhaps to some slightly painful terms, this idea of the managerial or the psychological model of leadership and moved in the direction of something to do with sacred charisma, a charism indeed, carried most reliably by those who have never hoped for it. We saw this in the context of Imam Shamil with the conflict forced upon him by the fact of Russian encroachment and also in the context of Imam Malik not wishing any kind of leadership and indeed preferring uh, the torture chamber to obeying caliphal whim. We're beginning to uh, look at this current uh, problem with more classically Islamic and religious eyes. Yes, if there is to be society, there must be order, there must be structures, there must be a leader and there must be the led, but the procedure whereby that falls naturally into place, has very little to do with the way in which contemporary democratic politics works, or contemporary celebrity culture works, or contemporary literary eminence, or how to become the CEO of AstraZeneca, and so on. It's something new, different, radical, and godly. What I want to do this time around, and inshallah there will be other uh, attempt to look at certain individuals, certain ideal types who in our heritage, in our imaginary body forth, certain ways in which this charism can unwillingly but rightly be assumed, <coughs> uh, is to investigate this in the context not of eminence but of its opposite. Hmm. We made them imams leaders guiding by our command when they had sabr, when they had patience, endurance. And to be imam in this Qur'anic sense is essentially to assume uh, an excellence that is inward, in other words, to lead oneself. To be master, not of one's destiny, that's God's business, but at least to hold the reins of the wild, unruly stallion that is the beast within, the ego and nafs al-ammara. This is true leadership. In the hadith, we are told, your worst enemy is your ego, which is between your two sides. Lead that, control it, subjugate it, trample upon it, become Moses, and you won't become Pharaoh the most elemental question of religious ethics. It's a pietistic subject, the center of just about every khutbah, overcome the lower self. So the charism of leadership in outward structural terms is rightly vested on those who don't want it because the ego is thoroughly under control. Unlike the current spectacle in Buenos Aires, 20 individuals who very much are happy to be there and see themselves as leaders, uh, the prophetic model is the opposite of that. It is about unwillingness, being dragged out of the khalwa to assume this responsibility. So leadership of the self, now this may also mean that one becomes, as it were, a symbolic leader rather than a political or an economic or a military leader. The figures who continue to inspire and humble us, who are listed in scripture, may accidentally almost be external leaders. They may be up there somehow with 
Napoleon and the rest, but that's not really the point, and that's certainly not why scripture is citing them. Instead, they are being uh, cited as examples of individuals, men and women, who led themselves, and as ideal types. You know, Moses' actual political impact in his time is less significant than what he means for us, the archetypes which he is representing. So they lead us, they are our leaders. Now there are many forms of this because there are many types of individuals and many aspects of life in which we need to be led. I guess we need leading chemists and leading doctors and leading uh, civil servants. Uh, all of that is fine and Islam has a way of being in those spaces. But there is also a form of leadership that copes with weakness, with marginalization, with difficulty, with brokenness. And this is why this Quranic verse, which I'm proposing, is to do with leadership. We made them leaders. It's God's decision. Lama sabar, when they had sabar, which is the essence of overcoming the ego. So you hold your hand back from what the ego craves and you put your hand forward to do what you really don't feel like doing. That's sabar, patient endurance. So the sabirin, the people of patience, have to, in our narrative, in our uh, pantheon, in our gallery of icons, individuals who are leaders in particular respect, has to include those who coped with and showed fortitude, sabr, in the face of adversity from a position of weakness and from a position of inner trauma and strain. And uh, this is something that will particularly hold our attention in our own strained times. There is a lot of brokenness out there. Many people carry stings of various kinds in their hearts. Post-traumatic stress disorder has become almost non-specific. You don't need to pass through a war nowadays in order to suffer from it in some way or another. The uh, depression rates, if you saw that Pew report, I think it was last week, amongst young people, universities, seem to double every five years. Mental illness, anxiety, self-harm, dieting disorders, body image issues, depression, all of that increasing, even though those are by global standards, gilded youth. Uh, they are not half-drowned refugees on the beaches of Sicily. They have nice BA positions at the University of Bristol or wherever, and the world is effectively, in the eyes of most, at their feet, but there is this damage within that has happened, and particularly it seems, and this has exercised the journalists um, with particular intensity, amongst women. Germaine Greer, her book, The Whole Woman, is about this, her looking back on the feminist movement, which she still supports, uh, and offers some good reasons to support. The old attitudes were ugly attitudes, but pointing out that the new utop utopia, which was expected by the sisterhood in the 50s and 60s, is looking pretty dystopian, just because of the brokenness that is out there. The failed relationships, the depression, the self-harm, the dieting disorders, the cutting, all of these things indicate that whatever modernity and its various revolutionary transformations might have brought, whatever doors have been opened, uh, it has come at some kind of psychic cost. And she just reflects on this without um, offering any particularly profound solutions or diagnosis. So what I want to do this time is to look at uh, this idea of how you uh, exemplify sabr, and therefore, in the Qur'an's logic, leadership, in a position of paradigmatic weakness. The Qur'an and the Muslim narrative is not just about heroes. It's not just about f the flashing of swords in the dawn light as the enemy come down like the wolf on the fold. No, it's uh, leadership is 
It's a more embracing and total thing. So what is it to be exemplary? And this word imam tends to have the sense of being exemplary. It's a metaphorical leader. These are our spiritual examples. These are our role models. These are our ideal types. Now we find, when we look at the female principle, and maybe depending on how long these lectures go on for, um, we'll look at one or two other cases in our history of ways of perfecting one's Muslimness in a paradigmatically feminine mode, that we have this uh, interesting and helpful hadith, which indicates that there have been four perfect women. In other words, four modalities of leadership. That doesn't mean there's only been four women in history who've reached the limit of their potential. God is gracious. It means that there's four modalities. And Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, who likes to reflect on these things because of his idea of the divine pleroma manifested through the per perfection, perfected qualities of certain human types. And he has this Fusus al-Hikam in which he lists the Quranic prophets, each of whom is a particular way of prismatically reflecting the single undifferentiated light of the divine, producing a different spectrum. But also amongst the feminine, there are alternate modalities. And we don't really have time, because it's going to be quite a dense topic, to map these out. But we know that according to the, the, the standard narratives of this hadith, the four perfect women, usually it's uh, Maryam, it's Khadija, it's Fatima, Aisha, and in some narratives also Asiya, who is the believing wife of the pharaoh of the Exodus. And looking around in the Hadith literature, you see different reasons why scripture values and validates them. So there isn't one ideal form of being female in our tradition, never has been. This has been an issue over the border in Catholicism. Marina Warner, writing her book, Alone of All Her Sex, which is a put down of traditional convert, uh, convent teaching about the Virgin Mary. Meek and mild, according to St. Ambrose, the only woman who ever pleased God. Mm -hmm. Passive, receptive, be it done unto me according to thy will. And not really any other very significant, salient, constantly repeated female types, apart from that, in the biblical or the Christian narrative. And when you get into Protestantism, she becomes even less significant and you're left with, who knows, the, the pastor's wife or something. Um, it's a fairly bare landscape. But in the Islamic context, we have the salient hadith four. Virgin Mary is one of them. Very briefly, we might uh, identify the type that they represent as follows. The Virgin Mary is the one who, indeed, and she has so much about her in the Qur'an, Al-Imran and Surat Maryam, uh, she is the one who surrenders to the divine decree and is gifted with the miracle of Al-Masih, alayhi salam. Asiya is the paradigm of the battered bride, the abused wife. The hadith says, when a woman is abused by her husband, she shall receive the reward of that which is given to Asiya, bint Muzahim, the wife of the pharaoh of the Exodus. So there's that possibility, the patient suffering wife also. In the context of Aisha, well, you have a very different type as well. Very outgoing, extroverted, scholarly, leading an army into battle, answering back uh, a strong, uh, vivacious, self-possessed type, unrecognizable. And Siddiqa, um, venerated in our tradition. Khadija, the type of the earth mother, kind of maternal, matronal, but also a paradigm hard to overthrow of a woman who is financially autonomous, employing men, 
she's the CEO of her caravan business or whatever. And if you read in modern Muslim feminist literature or some feminist mit literature, you'll see that she's one of the types that they like to extol. <coughs> whatever we make of this, leadership in a feminine context in Islam is not just a single thing, but has these different models of perfection. I'm not talking about approximation, I'm talking about perfection. Camilet. So uh, this is the complicated point at which we begin any consideration of what it is to be uh, a leader in this very special sort of imamate Islamic uh, conception in terms of the feminine uh, half of humanity, shaqa'iq al-rijal, the sisters of men. Now, what I want to do uh, here is to look at another ideal type, and we'll, as we proceed on the journey, see ways in which actually she represents um, aspects of all of the perfect women who are listed in, in the famous hadith. And somebody who is somewhat mysteriously veiled in our heritage, even though unanimously recognized as, in a sense, the founder of our heritage. Hmm. When we go to Mecca and we perform the obligation of Hajj, the fifth pillar, an obligation, one of the things that we do, we know that it's an Abrahamic recreation. It has cosmic and ontological significance and the journey to the center, and it's full of symbolism. Um, whether or not we understand the symbolism may not affect the way in which it works its alchemical effect on the soul. But one of the things that we do as part of the geometrical um, unfolding of the rituals of the Hajj, and there's a lot of geometry in Islamic rituals, and Charles André Gillis, the French Muslim writer, has written about the geometry and the symbolism of the Hajj particularly, is that you have the plain of Arafat, and you have the circles around the Kaaba, and you have straight lines, which is Sa'i, uh, between Safa and Marwa, and all of the basic forms of geometry are there around the cube, uh, the Dome of Heaven. It's a kind of perfect enactment of what, in very ancient primordial times, were taken to be the earthly concretizations of the uh, heaven-rooted facts of symmetry and geometry in the world. And when we go through the Hajj, we are confronted with that. So the, uh, the heart of that... <coughs> is the uh, tawaf, when we, as it were, join the circlings of the solar system and we become part of that circular gravitational moment, moths around the flame. flame. And also the sa'i, safa and marwa, um, with the symbolism that that entails. And we find that Hajar, there she is, this is Rembrandt, uh, is the foundress of a lot of this. And that's an interesting circumstance, as far as I can tell. She is the only woman who uh, initiated a practice in any major world religion. But you know, nobody denies it. Safa and Marwa, after all, is the coursing of Hajar, looking for uh, water for her son. And she is buried according to Azraqi and our other historians, in the Hijr, along with Ismail. That's why it's called the Hijr Ismail. This is the semicircular walled area um, on one side of the Kaaba, uh, which you have to walk around, otherwise your tawaf is not complete. That's actually a tomb. It's a mazar. When you go there, you can go up to the Saudi guards and explain that we're walking around a tomb here. Isn't it great? Um, but it's legislated, it's required. That is the Mazar of Hajar and Ismail, and that's a remarkable honor. Uh, it is their house. Ibrahim Khalilullah is buried far away in Hebron, Palestine. But those two are there. So we find that she's not really marginal, but kind of central in the... Um, the landscape of our religion and its geography, uh, there she is. S uh, but the story, and every Muslim child <coughs> learns the story, of her abandonment, her desolation, 
the difficulty of her solo situation in, in the desert is the, the theme that I want to look at today in order to present an image of uh, human excellence, of moral, spiritual leadership in the midst of a sea of troubles and disadvantages. Now, you always find with these really ancient archetypal narratives that the moment you start looking at them and start looking at the sort of pre-echoes of them in biblical texts, in this case, in the book of Genesis, and also in the tafsir literature, that there is so much going on that you don't even know where to start. Obviously, if she is kind of the foundress of Islam, Zamzam, Sa'i, she's buried there, the matriarch, uh, then there has to be something really gigantically emblematic about her that points to a certain uh, essential feature of Muslimness. She's not just some kind of random Egyptian slave girl who happened to be there that doesn't have much to do with who we are and what we are required to be. Necessarily, as Providence has designed these stories and shaped history, there is something essential about her which tells us something about how we are and how we are supposed to be. And it's not just about being patient and amazing things will happen. All of the Quranic prophetic stories are you know, about that. There's adversity, you're patient, and then some great thing happens. But there are closer symmetries. For a start, this. And Hajar is a funny kind of figure in Western art because uh, uh, they don't quite know what to make of her. The story is, in the book of Genesis, such a, an amazing story. Genesis is full of amazing stories. It's a masterpiece. Uh, and the Western mind is not quite sure what to do with her because so much that seems to be uh, spiritual and noble happens to her, even though, uh, according to the normal Jewish and Christian narratives, she's the kind of mother of the Saracens, of the Ishmaelites, of the outcast. And so this is always a kind of tense thing and much of the bathos of this art, and it's quite an extensive um, body of art, it was a popular theme, especially in the 17th, 18th century, is to do with this. Uh, God is hearing her in the wilderness, and there is the child dying, and the angel comes, ah, but, and this is very interesting, to a certain type of tragedy-oriented Western or Christian mind, actually, the story doesn't mean much. Nothing comes of this, historically, in fact. The Saracens come out of this, which is a big problem. So there's that tension that the angel is kind of saving her for what? For millennial darkness. Um, but here you have one of the best images in just a few uh, pen strokes. Uh, you have the human drama there, the, the confidence, the celestial nature of the angel with a few lines indicating where the angel has come from. Uh, and there she is uh, in supplication and uh, the child in a state of destitute, destitution. But those who know the Bible will say, well, this is extraordinary. Angels don't actually appear much, and in the Bible they hardly ever appear to women. Uh, and in the biblical narrative, she speaks to God. In the biblical narrative, she's actually the first person ever to shed tears. A lot of archetypal important things are happening here. And an angel coming to her to announce what? Well, the angel has already appeared to Abraham in order to give him the very surprising news that at the age of 80-something, with his wife in a similar age bracket, uh, that they're going to have a son who will be the heir to the covenant and progeny as numerous as suns in, uh, stars in the sky, one of those great Genesis moments. And uh, Abraham, in our narrative, of course, accepts this. But the angel comes and the promise is delivered. And then the angel comes and appears to Hajar. Now, if you know 
your Rembrandt and your Christian art, they all are aware of the fact that the only other time anywhere in biblical history that anything like this ever happens is in the story of the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin. It could be that story, except the child's already there. Um, but the maternal aspect of it, the, the sort of matronal vulnerability of womanhood is there. The fact that she is for the child and not for herself, for a progeny. Uh, and then the consolation, the amazement uh, produced by an angelic manifestation. And often, I mean, Rembrandt, certainly from that Protestant Dutch Puritan world, knew his, uh, his Bible. The narrative in Luke's Gospel, where the angel comes to the Virgin Mary, seems to be constructed, Rembrandt knew this, and modern scholars knew it, by people, whoever it was who wrote Luke's Gospel, we'll probably never know, who knew these stories in the Old Testament and knew about the Annunciation of Hajar. And there are certain evident symmetries and resonances between the two stories. Again, the church is going to have kind of neuralgic issues over this because Hajar is supposed to be the symbol of the unchosen. But she gets this kind of Christic, proleptic um, foreshadowing. So what else have I got? So many pictures. Yeah, that's a kind of more sort of Baroque image. Um, and again, but for the fact that she's already got a baby, you'd think, well, here is the Virgin Mary and the Annunciation. And, um, it's not quite Botticelli, but it's from uh, in sort of a post-Renaissance environment. Already slightly emotional, sentimental. She's kind of nicely dressed here. Rembrandt has her in rags. It's much more effective. Um, and where is the angel pointing her? Hmm. Well, out to the desert. That's the point in these stories. Uh, not to a uh, luxuriant and blessed progeny because she is not heir to the promise. She is the root out of dry ground. Uh, uh, so the angel is pointing her to the well, but subsequently to just the desert of the Ishmaelites the Ishmaelites become subsequently in uh, the biblical narrative, the emblem of that which is not Israel. They're the ones who capture Joseph, if you remember the story, and put, leave, uh, beat him up, put him in the well, um, the, the, take him out of the well, take him off to Egypt. The Ishmaelite is the kind of uh, wild man, the emblem of unchosenness, the non-covenanted peoples. So take a look at these two things. This is back in Holland. Uh, and both by the same artist. Now, here again, even though these are from different periods of his life, I can't remember which comes first, the traditional Western biblically educated imagination uh, necessarily had to conflate these stories and see them as archetypes of different principles that nonetheless had parallels. And in England, until 50 years ago, everybody would know these stories. And if you heard them, you would make the comparisons. Um, when my father was a child, the only game he was allowed to play on Sundays were games involving the Bible. That's how England has changed. And now it's Sunday shopping, like compulsory. But back then, you, know, you had to play scriptural games. And actually, in his effects, I found a little a picture, which was a picture of um, Hajar and Ishmael in the wilderness. People used to, 100 years or 50 years ago, give each other little pictures of biblical stories. People lived in the Bible. Nowadays, hardly anybody reads it. It said that at the end of his life, Churchill was given a copy of the Bible to read. And he said, this book is very well written. Why has nobody brought it to my attention before? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not a biblical... Um, Anglophone community any longer, unless we're American evangelical. So we tend not to pick up these things. But something very interesting is going on here with Rubens. Paintings, of course, all symbolize something, not, uh, not least the color. Hajar is very often represented in red in Western art. Why? Because that's the color of desire. She is the concubine. She's the one who 
Abraham and Hajar have kind of borrowed to be a kind of surrogate mother because Sarah has obviously passed it, and so she's the nubile Egyptian teenager who is just um, to produce the child of the flesh, not the child of the covenant. So red, fire, desire. Uh, whereas the Virgin Mary, of course, there she is being uh, brought up to heaven because she can't die being not under the influence of... Um, uh, uh, original sin. Uh, blue, her natural colour is the colour of heaven. That's where she belongs. She's queen of heaven, Mata Coelis. Uh, so there she is going up. And of course, she's looking up to her natural home. Hadra is kind of looking down. She has got a kind of hand sort of pushing away. There is Abraham and Sarah. And the dog barking at her, of course. She has to go out because... Sarah now has the child, and so no more use for Hajar, and so she gets pushed out into just nowhere, the wilderness. And in the imagination of the Genesis authors, that would mean certain death. It's another, you know, it's like cut the throat of your son moment. It's a binding moment. Uh, off she goes with the child into the desert where um, somebody will cut her throat or she will die of thirst, and that very nearly happens, of course. So. These two things juxtaposed represent these, perhaps the two most salient women in the Christian scripture <coughs> doing opposite things, even though um, there are analogies in their lives. So this uh, <coughs> later... <coughs> Feminine representation of this great fork in the road of monotheistic history, Historia monotheistica, uh, is something that continues to be significant, at least in terms of Jewish and Christian self-understanding. The book of Genesis is setting up certain tensions, uh, antinomies, opposites, the chosen and the unchosen, the Israelite and the Gentile, the local and the foreign, the fertile, the infertile, all of these oppositions are there in the book of Genesis and the subsequent narrative of the Hebrew scripture in particular, which is about God's providence to his people, is seen in terms of these original chosen, unchosen dichotomies, of which perhaps the most salient is Ishmael and Isaac, Hajar and Sarah, because of course she's not from the chosen people because she comes from Egypt. Egypt, for the authors of the Hebrew Bible, is the place where the foreigners live. It's the place where you go into exile. It's the place where they enslave you. It's the place where Israel is persecuted. So as an Egyptian, to bring that blood into the patriarchal line is kind of miscegenation. That's the worst kind of mixed marriage. So the logic is she has to go off. She has to be ejected into the wilderness because she's... The dry branch, the true seed in this amazing Genesis sort of fork in the road is you know, the elderly woman producing a baby. And so the firstborn, who everybody thought was going to be it, ah, turns out at the last moment not to be it, but the symbol of rejectedness. So we find in a rabbinic commentary the idea of this woman as being a kind of emblem of everything that is not right. And that's there throughout the sort of Talmudic narratives. Um, so, in one Haggadic narrative, Hagar cleaved to Abraham and gave birth to Ishmael, but in the end she returned to her stench. Another text, this is called Agarat Bereshit, says that she is fertile not because of a divine blessing, but because she's a Gentile, she's Egyptian, and they're naturally promiscuous. They're like donkeys. Uh, and this, again, is to do with her servile, slave, proletarian origin. Like a donkey, she's made for hard work. Uh, sometimes they also came up with a legend which presented her as uh, Pharaoh's daughter, um, who was necessarily enslaved by uh, the true people. So we have uh, 
this image already before the rise of Islam, and when Islam comes around, this becomes part of the rabbinic discussion of who the Saracens are, the Ishmaelites, Yishmaelim. They seem to be very numerous, like the stars in the sky. They seem to be ruling the world from the Pyrenees to the gates of China and just about everywhere where Jews could prosperously live. But they come from this Egypt, unchosenness, Gentile status, servility, ticking all of the boxes that indicate that you're not part of the people. All of the boxes are represented in her and in the idea that the Ishmaelites are. The Muslims, who may be now ruling the world, but it's still a kind of pharaonic world. It's not the world of chosenness. And this becomes very comforting to uh, uh, many. So one modern rabbinic specialist says, in general, the rabbis have rushed to blame the victim. She seems to be the victim, but actually, um, no, she is the one on whose head all of the polemic should fall. So one uh, contemporary writer, um, um, Aviva Zornberg, saying, why is Sarah chucking her out to almost certain death and getting rid of the son? Isn't that unethical? But Sarah is characterized as a righteous woman. Ah, it's a preemptive strike because she knew what, uh, what a hassle the Ishmaelites would be for the chosen people and therefore it was right to kill them in advance because of what would happen thousands of years later um, as a result of his survival. Then we get um, just a few more images. Uh, here we're getting into sort of late 19th century sentimentality. Again, this difficulty in the Western mind. Is this, she's an entirely positive, sympathetic figure in the Jewish Christian scriptures, but she is also presented as the emblem of otherness and of rejection. Here's a more recent image. What could be more admirable than this? It's not the Virgin Mary sort of fleeing to Egypt. Instead, something is happening the other way around. Um, she's got her son, Ishmael, but she is Egyptian, but she has been ejected from the promised land. So much metaphor is going on here that, of course, the image continues to attract the attention of the artist. And there's her um, little ibrik in the corner there. So then we get the uh, world of the New Testament. What are they going to make of this story? And we have one... Uh, we have this text, which is in Genesis, which then becomes taken up by the church as an example of otherness. And in the eyes of Paul, the otherness of Israel. Ishmael, do we know what the word means? Ishaq, he laughed, or she laughed, because of the improbability of his birth. Ishmael, God heard, in other words, heard um, Abraham's prayer. There you have, this is one of the nicest pictures, this is Koro again, uh, and the angel just discreetly visible. Doesn't really, doesn't really look like Makkah, does it? But he was, didn't leave France, I think, so it's the best he could do. Okay, so the Christians looking at these texts in Genesis, always looking at them, and particularly starting with St. Paul, as uh, examples of what is going to happen in future years. And so they had to get their heads around this text. Again, it's very pro hagerine pro-Ishmaelite. Again, the angel is speaking to Hajar. Hmm. What troubles you, Hajar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the voice of the boy. I will make a great nation of him. For St. Paul, for Augustine, for Origen, for Tertullian, for all of the church fathers who spent a lot of time working on these scriptural archetypes. This is another headache. What does it mean, a great nation? Now, Martin Lings, of course, in his Sira book, has this as chapter one, the great nation. 
Of course, greatness is greatness in the spirit. That's all God is interested in. So truly a great nation, the presentiment of the religion whose center will be the ancient house in Mecca, which is her sanctuary. But what are the Christians going to do with this? Well, what we get hmm, is one of the strangest rhetorical stunts pulled by St. Paul is to turn that on its head to say that actually Hajar and Ishmael are a, a coded symbol representing the Jews who wouldn't accept Christ. Now, nothing could have been further from the minds of those who wrote those texts in the book of Genesis, but this becomes the normative Christian doctrine, still is for evangelicals when they think about this story. It's in his letter to the Galatians. Okay, so he get, gives you the, the idea of the dichotomy, okay, according to the flesh. Just the DNA is inherited, but uh, the DNA of Isaac is spiritual as well. And this great fork becomes even more intensified. But he says Hajar, because of her kind of Arabian southern identity, uh, represents slavery and hence Judaism. Uh, in other words, those Jews who have rejected Paul's interpretation of who Jesus was are actually following the Ishmaelite fork in the road. And it's the Christians who are the true descendants of Isaac. And it's the Jews who are the descendants of Ishmael. And that's really what this story is about. For him, at last, he's able to make sense of this thing that seems to lead nowhere. But the Jerusalem that is above... The church is free. And this links also with his idea of freedom and slavery, which for him represents whether or not you submit to the Mosaic law, dietary rules, circumcision, and so forth. Because for him, newly baptized Gentile converts don't have to do all of that stuff. That's part of slavery to the law. But the Christian is in a state of gospel freedom and therefore is the natural son of Isaac. Whereas the, those who are descendants of the slave are actually now identified with the Jewish people, not with the Ishmaelites and the Arabs. And this is a very extraordinary and original moment in Paul. And this text in particular is right at the heart of modern right-wing American theocon evangelical reflection on Islam. They, like Paul and like the rabbis, want an explanation that's biblical for what's going on now in the Middle East. And so they hit on this text, <coughs> but with their own uh, take on it, this is from an evangelical website, which puts it very clearly, <coughs> uh, very absolutely. On the left, red, it's like traffic lights. <laughs> All of this is the bad stuff. Uh, earthly, enslaved, uh, race, it's just genealogy. Disinherited, in other words, it's just like a little river going off into the desert, sinking in and leading to nothing. And then on this side, you have all of the good stuff culminating, presumably, in Bible-believing modern Trump voters. This is the kind of mindset that millions and millions of them are currently working with. And if you ever cross swords metaphorically with any of them, you'll find that this dichotomy is the biblical point where they think that they have cornered Islam. Muslims say they're descendants of Hajar. They even go to where she's buried, and that's Arabia, and that's the law, Sharia law, which we've banned in Tennessee now, of course. Uh, so Islam is anticipated in the biblical text by these narratives, whereas um, God has given the green light uh, to the country that stretches from sea to shining sea and the American special vocation to the world as a Christian civilization, et cetera, et cetera, the normal narrative of triumphalism. And they use this dichotomy, the Ishmael-Isaac uh, dichotomy. And uh, 
this has become very significant in our time. And you find the same thing in uh, the Russian Orthodox Church as well. Um, because, after all, Islam is post-biblical. And if you've got a biblical worldview, you're going to find you do have to resort to this kind of allegorical interpretation in order to get anything um, biblical about Islam. Whereas Muslims, of course, have lots of stuff in the Qur'an about earlier prophets. We already have um, a, an abundance of information and theological perspectives, but for them, dealing with later religions is a problem. But this is the text that they have found. So it leads in this direction. Hajar is about foreignness, alienation, flesh, law, enslavement, desire. Um, whereas the narrative that leads up to usually white American evangelical uh, Christians is the line of gospel freedom. So America, the city on the hill, the land of the free, etc. It all fits as part of this narrative, which is hugely influential in today's world and affects voting patterns and foreign policy and uh, it's uh, an example of the enduring power of these ancient stories. However, <clears throat> not everybody who reads the Bible finds this kind of violent dichotomy within it. Mm. They are somewhat taken aback when they engage with Muslims, because Muslims, after all, are supposed to be the great dichotomizers. Uh, the infidels, them and us, black and white differentiation, Darul Islam, Darul Harb, but American Christians seem to be absolutely in that mode. The good guys, the bad guys, if you're not for us, you're against us. Bush was very keen on quoting the Bible. Um, and for a lot of Western churchgoers and synagogue goers, this is a little bit uh, of a disappointing thing to find in their scripture. Is this ethically the best that the Bible can do when dealing with the fact of Ishmael, who is now a quarter of the world's population and counting, and vibrant and active, and and the midterms, another couple of Muslims were elected to Congress, and Islam is everywhere. And you can't just say it's the Antichrist and evil. Deal with it through drone strikes. Uh, we need something a little bit better. And when they encounter the Muslim account, which is that we don't accept ever any kind of dichotomizing between the two sons, they become quite thoughtful. Because we have never had uh, this kind of polarization. We don't read those stories in those terms. We're really not very interested in that strand of biblical narrative, which is one of the biggest strands, which is about chosenness. God chooses those whom he chooses. The Holy Prophet is called Al-Mustafa, the chosen one, even though he's from Hajar and not from Sarah. So, uh, taken aback, wrong-footed, embarrassed, and they want to know whether they too can have an inclusive model. Is there some way in which Hajar can be rehabilitated? Some way in which you can, as um, the Tory cabinet puts it, have your cake and eat it. Mm. You have the book of Genesis, but you also have some kind of inclusive model of religion, even though those Genesis narratives were really deliberately and fiercely constructed to divide and to differentiate. Well, interesting story of how Hajar is received in modern uh, Jewish and Christian re-readings. So let's whiz through a few of these. Usually, as you can imagine, in kind of feministic readings of, of scriptural tradition. Okay, so here you have a kind of uh, postmodern reflection. So Augustine, who, as you'd expect, with his love of dichotomies, made a big deal of the unchosenness of Hajar and accepting Paul's identification of Hajar as the, the Jewish temple still in the grip of slavery to the law. Hmm. You have this uh, very interesting reflection that uh, as he abandons the whole Judaic template of allegorical reading, necessarily the allegory that Paul is using has to be rejected as well. Paul was schooled in 
rabbinical context and the way in which he's rereading the Old Testament as allegory is absolutely recognisable in terms of first century Palestinian Hellenised Judaic way of allegorical reading of the scripture. So she's kind of turning the tables on this turning of the tables by saying that you can't even have that Judaic insistence that everything has to be a typology. And of course, um, the denial of um, uh, polarities is one of the key themes of uh, postmodernism. So there's an ironic reflection, which is quite symptomatic of, of what's happening. Here's another, and again, this is an African-American feminist writer. Uh, and for her, one of the interesting things is the Egyptianness of Hajar. And for a lot of uh, black feminists, that means the Africanness, and therefore, in some sense, whatever the exact color, pigmentation of her skin, Africanness, blackness. It's the African continent. And so, for a lot of African American authors now who are interested in overturning these biblical uh, archetypes, Hajar has become not the heroine of a story that becomes. The, the wrong story, the story of unchosenness, but instead a heroine. One of the big things that's happening in feminist exegesis of the Bible is that their favorite character in the whole Bible is actually Hajar, even though for the evangelicals and the big church down the road, she is the matriarch of those pesky Arabs. That's one of the tensions in American culture now, particularly in these African-American contexts where there is a lot of reflection on the legacy of slavery, exclusion, racism, broken families, single parenthood, inner pain, trauma, anxiety, depression, suffering. And so it's a kind of issue in theodicy. She becomes the biblical image of the oppressed woman. So here's some random quotes from uh, this book, which kind of focuses on Hajar and is about solidarity with the outcast woman. Now, first of all, she points out, uh, and there's been some interesting studies on the figure of Hajar in American fiction in the early, mid-19th century, that she's often a slave name, uh, and that because of her servility and the fact that her servility is characterised as a right thing for an Egyptian to be in, that it was one of the big arguments um, in favour of slavery in America. <coughs> and the idea of Ishmael as the kind of legitimate, legitimate reject, the outcast. Remember, Moby Dick begins with the words, call me Ishmael, because it's about his sense of outsider status, and that would certainly have been understood by Bible reading uh, America. Uh, and then African Americans, as they have read the Bible, are not going to go along with the established exegesis of the slave owners and their latter day uh, heirs, but instead have to reread the Bible in ways that might reject um, Augustine, the patristic consensus, the demonizing of the African, the single mother, the refugee, the woman, all of these negative things, uh, and actually rehabilitate them in a kind of form of uh, uh, liberation theology. Right. Okay, so one of the things that she wants to talk about is the falsity of the servility of, uh, the idea of the civility of Ishmael and Hajar, and this is of course a concern for Muslims as well. Hajar, was she concubine, slave girl, bit on the side, legitimate wife. Um, uh, it's a polemic, and particularly in Muslims who are fighting against the evangelicals who want to say that, talk about the illegitimacy of slave descent. This has become an issue. So she comes up with uh, observations like this, that according to the authors of the book of Genesis, the idea that Abraham and Sarah might have feared that there might have been a real inheritance through Ishmael indicates uh, that Hajar can't have been a slave or a concubine because if she had had that status, there's no way in which Ishmael would have inherited anything. So what we're starting to see is a 
without there being much reference to anything Islamic, a kind of parallelism to what Muslims have found in these ancient uh, narratives. And sometimes the parallel is remarkably close. So she's now become crucial. All of these modern tick box issues, race, sex, class, she's from uh, all of those criteria for unchosenness, which the uh, pre-modern Jewish and Christian consensus assumed made her the icon of unworthiness, are actually the kind of things which sort of left-inclined American activists uh, are most concerned about. So it's quite a radical overturning of the former consensus. The fact that she is African, the fact that she is um, female, the fact that she is a slave, the fact that she is servile, proletarian, subject, single mother, all of those things indicate that instead of being the kind of mysterious anti-hero of the Bible, the matriarch of unchosenness, she's actually um, their favourite um, figure of the entire biblical text. So again, one of the biggest things that has happened in biblical interpretation in recent years. Now, here is uh, the mainstream, if you like, Stephen Kepnes, quite a significant Jewish thinker, reflecting on this, and of course with one eye on the catastrophes of the Middle East and the haves and the have-nots, eyeballing each other through the Gaza fence and the extreme polarities of um, uh, the, the modern reality of this uh, ancient Abrahamic dichotomy. Um, this is a way in which he reflects on this. It's not the major theme of the book, which is quite sort of synthetic in general, but of course he has to refer to it. Hajar, the other, in Hebrew, Hagar, the other, who comes from Egypt, a land of exile and slavery, the wife of the patriarch Abraham, through whom all the peoples of the earth are blessed. If Islam is rooted in the Hebrew scriptures, what this opens up is a new possibility to see Islam as not opposed to the Judeo-Christian tradition of monotheism, but indeed as a part of it. Through Hajar and Ishmael, Islam finds its place as simultaneously the first child of Abraham and the third stage in the development of monotheism. Wow, well, medieval rabbis would have not find that recognisable because the essence of the story whereby otherness, Gentile status, is constructed for the biblical writers is this idea of the driving out of Hajar and her son. But now it's been reread, rehabilitated through um, the modern hermeneutic term known as scriptural reasoning, whereby you read scriptural texts in order to find the most pragmatic and benign outcomes. Uh, and this is what he has now found. Now, of course, the Judeo-Christian tradition, that's a very bogus concatenation because the Old and the New Testaments don't really fit together at all well. And uh, those two principles have um, had more of a hate relationship than a love relationship down the centuries. And Islam metabolically in many ways, structurally, legally, monotheistically is, is closer to Judaism than Christianity is. You might speak of a Judeo-Islamic tradition, possibly, in medieval Spain, for instance. Judeo-Christian tradition, mm, after those dichotomies that Paul is insisting on, that's more difficult. But anyway, he's happy to use this, um, I guess, for his ironically minded uh, readers. But you can see that the, uh, the enormous scale of the overturning which has happened here. Okay, now let's rewind and think about the Muslim narratives. Okay, there's Rembrandt again. He liked this theme. Now, the funny thing, and I don't have a clear-cut answer for you about all of this, is that even though uh, the Jewish and Christian traditions have always identified Muslims as Hagerines and as Ishmaelites, and we also identify ourselves as Hagerines and Ishmaelites, and the Hajj doesn't make much sense unless you, know, you recognize that you're recreating her uh, thirsty steps, reenacting that 
moment of self-sacrifice, um, we are Ishmaelites. There's an interesting circumstance that it's not really very, she is not really mentioned in the Quran, unlike the Virgin Mary. And the Hajarine aspect of that story is not really in the Quran. I'm not really sure why that should be. Maybe because it was kind of already obviously known. But in any case, it's uh, certainly salient in our historians. So here we have um, Tabari's narrative, uh, the first truly great tafsir, uh, which is, again, the angel, this time identified with Gabriel. Remember, Gabriel, the angel of revelation, the same one who comes to the Virgin Mary, not any old angel. Gabriel, Muslims have always agreed that she saw Gabriel and uh, spoke to him. And then you have this dialogue, which is quite similar again to the uh, Quranic narrative of the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin, mm, where he is questioning and she gives a very Muslim answer. To whom did he entrust you? You're all on your own in this desert place. Abraham uh, let you down. And she replies, Wakalani uh, ila kef. He entrusted me to one who is sufficient. Then the angel says, Yeah, he entrusted you to one who is enough. The boy rubs, his, uh, rubs the ground with his toe. Zamzam appears, and that story begins. The symbol of salvation in the desert is water, and the water of life, which is revelation, salvation, ensues. So that's just one uh, bit from the uh, Muslim historians where they talk about this. But what we need to bear in mind is that uh, she, like the Virgin Mary, is always characterized as somebody who accepts divine providence. Hmm? When the Virgin is in the desert uh, giving birth beneath the palm tree, she cries out because of the pain. But she's not angry with anyone. And she's not angry with God. And then the miracles are given to her. One of the miracles is, of course, um, the well that comes from beneath her. Which is not, of course, the biblical account doesn't have the palm tree and the desert and it's um, the three wise men and the shepherds and the manger. It's, the Quranic narrative is quite different. Uh, but again, the Hagerine resonances are very clear and the fact of you know, the, the miraculous deliberation through the water and the dates, um, which in Islam are differentiated because the water is a spiritual thing. It's from the first shahada, it comes from heaven, whereas the dates come from the earth, from the oasis, from life. And so it's to do with the second shahada. In Jerusalem, they, they come together in the story. But um, she is paradigmatically the one who accepts and surrenders um, despite the uh, apparent desperation of her plight. So, in the contemporary period, we find that this story, which is occasionally there in our heritage, and again, it's a bit mysterious, perhaps, that, say, Jalaluddin Rumi in his copious poetry has lots of stuff about the Virgin Mary, not much about Hajar, a few lines here and there, that she hasn't quite, even though she is our foundress, caught our collective imagination the way the Blessed Virgin did. It's an interesting circumstance that in the modern period there has been a lot more interest 
and it generally is an interest that's pretty disconnected to the revival of interest in her and the repristination of her memory that we find amongst uh, sort of American uh, minority feminists. Uh, but some of the same issues are um, to be found. So, for instance, uh, Ali Shariati, the 1970s, a name to conjure with amongst Muslim revolutionary activists uh, killed by the Shah's secret police in this country, I think, who writes a book on the Hajj after his experience of the Hajj and his experience of it as a radical levelling of human beings, <coughs> rather as Malcolm X experienced it as a place where people are dressed the same and race doesn't matter and uh, all of the hierarchy of um, American society is just abolished. Shariati had the same kind of idea in a kind of almost socialistic idea uh, because much of his rhetoric when he was teaching dodging the secret police in, in Tehran was about uh, Islam as an anti-elite movement. He read the Qur'an as being a series of stories about you know, prophets who were from the people, who experienced the poverty and the disempowerment of the people, being oppressed by the tyrants, whether it's Nimrod or Abu Lahab or Pharaoh or whoever. He saw it really as a kind of narrative of class struggle. And his uh, point is, I think, a perfectly legitimate one that the tradition would not object to, which is that God tends to work through the despised and the broken-hearted. So as is there doing his tawaf, thinking, well, what is this about? Well, her tomb is here, and her masa is there, and this is a ritual uh, of which she is in many respects the foundress, who does God choose? Not the Shah of Iran. He just had his enormous party that cost billions um, at Persepolis, um, building palaces for world leaders that were only used, you know, each leader had a palace and it was only used for two nights. Gigantic uh, extravagance and contempt for the values of the masses. So he, on his Tawaf, in front of the Kaaba, thinks this. This is who God really chooses. From among all humanity, it was a woman. From among all women, it had to be a slave. And from among all slaves, a black maid. So he sees this as the socialist method, message of the Hajj. Uh, it's about, it's the ritual of the poor. It is the shrine and temple of the poor, where they can be you know, in the front like anybody else, all of the normal disabilities and hierarchies are swept away in the whirl of the tawaf. Everybody is there and it doesn't matter whether you're stepping on the toe of a billionaire or a Pakistani sweeper, it's just another human being. It's very uh, inspired by this. And this has been a theme with uh, quite a lot of particularly Iranian um, uh, revolutionary writers. So one of the most popular uh, religious women's uh, magazines in Iran, Payami Hagar, is um, the, mes the message of Hajar, seen as a kind of patroness of revolutionary women, God with the outcast, the rejected, the refugee, the asylum seeker, the ethnically impure. All of those boxes are ticked. That's where God is and is not in the palaces of the wealthy. And wealth is a burden. Uh, hanging around one's neck, pulling one down to the grave and to the earth. So this has been uh, significant, but not for everyone. Here is a Syrian writer who comes up with a very different interpretation, uh, more old-fashioned. What does Hajar represent for modern women? A well-mannered woman who obeys her husband, believes in God, whose husband settles her in Mecca, is at peace with her state as a second wife, who bears a child and is grateful to God for his blessings and never complains, the model of the righteous and believing woman. Mm. There you have that template as well. Uh, there's been something of an outpouring of literature about her in the modern Middle East. 
and some books in Pakistan as well, and also in Turkey, where uh, her meaning as the patroness of Islam is explored in terms of contemporary arguments about women's roles. Um, and he's a bit of an Arab nationalist as well, so he actually can't quite accept that she was a kind of pharaonic ancient Egyptian. Uh, he says she was actually a pure-blooded Arab from Arabia. He has a chapter on this which doesn't actually give you any evidence, but seems to be something that um, resonates with him. Um, al Uruba. So... Uh, then, modern Muslim feminists. Rifat Hassan, who is from uh, Pakistan, uh, like quite a few contemporary feminists, or at least women's writers, women's issues writers in the Muslim world, have, I guess, rightly seized upon her as a kind of emblem, rather as the uh, feminists in the West reading the Bible have seized upon her. So, the image of autonomous femaleness She's constructed in those terms because she's on her own. A single mother looking after her son and experiencing angels and being an agent autonomously is important, not just for Muslim daughters of Hajar, but for all women who are oppressed by systems of thought, of structures based on ideas of gender, class, or racial inequality. Like her, her women must have the faith and courage to venture out of the security of the known into the insecurity of the unknown and to carve out with their own hands a new world from which the injustices and inequities that separate men from women, class from class, race from race, have been eliminated. Well, sounds very similar to what some of those African-American feminists have been saying. Uh, and there is a convergence, and Rifat Hassan is occasionally invited to contribute to volumes edited by uh, American feminists. But still, uh, this is perhaps another of... Hajar's enigmas, ways in which she is veiled, in that for the Western imaginary, whether evangelical or not, the Muslim really is the emblem of otherness. The Muslim is the Taliban, the Muslim is Daesh, the Muslim is the dark other, the Ger, the Gentile, the un-American principle. And this idea of the radical othering of Muslims has become one of the key features of populism across the Western world now. Whether it be Pauline Hansen in Australia, or Breitbart News in the United States, or Viktor Orban in Hungary, or Marine Le Pen, their anxieties about rapid globalization and social change and the death of tradition tend to focus on a culprit, a human culprit, rather than just globalization, which is usually the foreigner, and usually the foreigner as represented by the Muslim, the asylum seeker, the refugee, the emblematic foreigner, the one who is present in such disturbingly large numbers, who is fertile, who is traditional, who is religious, who is all of the things that Europe once was and uh, now isn't, but on the right, there are certain... Uh, nostalgic voices that wish that, what's more, we were those things. So uh, this is at the centre of many of the psychic tensions of, of the modern West, populism accelerated by this issue of the Muslim other and the veil and Hajar as kind of the emblem of that because of uh, her fecundity, because of her otherness, her racial difference, her poverty. Hajar, once again, is the symbol of unchosenness. And the idea, most recently, of the, the migrant, hmm? that ancient story continues today. There she is, even now, heading out of Iraq or somewhere, um, oppressed by something or other. This is present in our world on a massive scale. Generally, it is the women who bear the brunt of armed conflict. Um, they're the ones who are left to fend for themselves. Uh, they're the ones who are open to abuse and exploitation, and uh, they're the ones who are the real leaders in many cases because they're the ones who have sabr. Hajar, a leader, because she had sabr, an exemplar, the one around whose tomb we swirl, 
uh, and uh, uh, as a result, um, we remember that these stories are not just pretty tales of long ago, ancient epics and legends, Asaltir al-Awwalin, but are in fact uh, representations of eternal human possibilities and situations that are absolutely with us today. And we need to remember this. Ali Shariati's insistence that Hajj is about solidarity with the poor, something which the modern Saudis seem to have forgotten with their insistence on putting the poor people as far as possible, out of sight and out of the way, while you have these gigantic five-star megastructures everywhere and a kind of plush Ritz-Carlton experience of the Hajj. That's not what it's there for. The point of the Hajj is to emphasize that most unpopular reality in the eyes of the G20, which is God is with the weak, the broken-hearted, the disregarded, the despised, the other race, the other gender, all of those things that the feminists and the Muslim thinkers have simultaneously uh, identified that it is not just about justice and equality, but is about um, where God's final vindication is likely to be found because she had the Zamzam and we revere her name. Uh, and so it is always in sacred history. The leaders, the real leaders, are often those who are almost invisible and seem to be at the back of the crowd somewhere while the demagogues are thundering at the front. But it's prayer and patience and pure-heartedness that in the Qur'an's vision truly make history and trigger uh, the divine response. So perhaps that's the uh, final uh, lesson that we should draw from this veiled leader. Uh, that's what I've got. Any questions? Anyone still awake? Well, there's a lot of legendary material. There's nothing that's there in sort of reliable Muslim scriptures. Uh, there is in some of the uh, Muslim legends the idea that she was Pharaoh's daughter. You do find that in some of the Israeliyat. Uh, that seems to have come from uh, Jewish ideas which were there to kind of represent her as the essence of the oppressive otherness of, of Egypt. I don't think there's any possibility of establishing something like that historically. Yep. Um, most of these paintings that you showed the current ones, you projected her as a brown woman and not as a black woman. Mm -hmm. How would you interpret that? The fact that if you were in Italy in the 17th century, that was the only way you could ever possibly imagine a woman as looking. Um, and you know, Christ would always be blonde, and that was just how things were. Um, yeah. Is there anything about her after the Zamzam and what she did after that? Um, <coughs> I'm not sure that I recall the stories. I think if you look at uh, the Seerah of Ibn Hisham and also at uh, Tabari's history, both in English, you can find uh, various accounts of uh, Abraham visiting them uh, in the desert, uh, bringing them provisions subsequently to travel down from Palestine in order to see them, uh, and then uh, presiding over the marriage of her son uh, Ishmael to a woman from Jurham, which was a local Arabian tribe, uh, and then being buried there. Um, that's all I recall, but there's a lot of, sort of legendary material that's out there. Hmm. Anyone else? Are we persuaded by this idea that <coughs> this foundress of Islam actually happens to be America's famous biblical feminist icon? Is there an irony or strangeness there? Can we make anything of it? Okay, plenty of food for thought there, inshallah. Thank you for your patience. Assalamu alaikum. Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers.